you. I, I'm not sure um, greater claim for anything other than combining long words with swear words, which is effectively what the officer class probably do, much to Martin's chagrin. I should probably tell him now, although it might come as a, a really annoying thing, that the only real test, as I was told, at uh, Westbury, which is the course you have to go to to become an officer, is not an intelligence test. Uh, it's only an assault course, and there's a fake window. And if you jump through the window when you're told to do it without checking what's on the other side, you pass. And if you check, you fail. And you can ask whether that's really what you want the people um, <laughs> leading you into war to have passed the test. But, but if only you jumped through the window, Martin, um, perhaps it would be different. Um, as was said, I, I wrote a book um, about a very brief um, time I spent in the army, but I was fortunate enough to have served at a particularly busy time on, on the wars that Martin alluded to. Um, and I've got a, another book um, coming out, fortunately sufficiently in the future, I'm not quite um, pushing it as hard as, as some, but um, it's about the Afghans. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today about the cultural differences um, between the British soldiers who are currently in Afghanistan and their Afghan colleagues, their Afghan comrades, who we are told um, are part of the exit strategy, um, to use that sort of slightly clunky phrase, um, for us in Afghanistan. Uh, and when I'd been preparing uh, over the weekend, I'd been hoping to sort of do some light-hearted stuff. My, my favourite photo from the whole time I spent in Afghanistan is, um, is taken uh, back in 2007 during the middle of, of quite a big operation. It was about sort of uh, 72 hours long clearance of a village, and it, it was quite intense. I think it was probably the moment I realised that, totally to my surprise, what I hadn't thought would be the case when I joined the army in 2004, uh, that I was effectively fighting a very similar conflict to what my grandfather fought in the Second World War in the Bocage. I mean, it was incredibly slow, incredibly painful, incredibly hot, um, and we were taking quite a lot of casualties, which was sort of the three least ideal things as, a, as an infantry soldier. Um, and I had been working with the Afghans. That was my great privilege. Um, and, and it really was a privilege, contrary to what you may hear and what you may read. I, I had a huge amount of time for the Afghan National Army soldiers I worked for. Um, they weren't perfect, but neither are British Army soldiers, neither are any soldiers. Um, and they get a bad press, and, and that's partly what I wanted to address, even though the timing is inauspicious, given, obviously, what happened at the weekend and what was reported in the press today. And I think about two hours ago, we sadly learned uh, the names of the three soldiers who were killed on Sunday by an Afghan policeman. But, but I'll come to that because I wanted to describe to you this photograph because for me it, it captured um, the essence of, of working um, in Afghanistan with the Afghans. And it was, a, it was a joyful photo in a way and a mad photo in, in a way. Um, it was about 40 degrees, this was mid-July, um, in, in the green zone in Helmand, which anybody who reads even lightly will know is, is pretty hot. Um, and we were all sweating. Uh, the British Army under quite protective body armour, carrying very heavy kit, um, really, really sunk. Our, our Afghan counterparts um, travelling a bit more lightly, we would say unprotected, but you know, there's a sort of difference of cultures. Uh, and, and one of the compounds that we'd cleared through that had been being defended by the Taliban had, bizarrely, this huge uh, rainbow golfing umbrella. Um, and, and always in Afghanistan, in my mind, the colour of Afghanistan is basically green and yellow with these flashes of a very bright colour, the kind of blue of a burqa or a really colourfully dressed child. Uh, and then this, this rainbow umbrella, with this, which this very um, thoughtful Afghan soldier picked up and, and started following me around the battlefield using as a parasol. Um, <laughs> which, of course, wasn't ideal because it was about the most brightly coloured thing in the entire green zone. So we kind of started attracting loads and loads of incoming fire. Um, and I, I thought uh, at the weekend that I'd come and, and, and sort of talk to you lightheartedly about um, the cultural differences between ourselves and the Afghans and then how they can throw up things like that. But, of course, um, on, on Sunday we learned that leaving uh, Ashura, which is a kind of local community engagement meeting, uh, a, a warrant officer from the Royal Signals and two young guardsmen from the Welsh Guards were killed, um, ostensibly by, by one of their colleagues, by one of their comrades, a, a policeman from the Afghan Civilian Order Police, uh, which is supposed to be a more professional, more efficient, uh, more reputable unit than the Afghan National Police, who, who have well-publicised problems. Uh, and I read this uh, and my heart sank and I got a sense of, um, I've been here before. Um, because in 2010, uh, when I was coming back from a visit to Afghanistan, I'd visited my former regiment, the Grenadier Guards, who were out there. Um, and I'd come back uh, cautiously optimistic. I had seen some signs of progress compared to when I'd been there previously. And I, and I flew back with a bunch of soldiers and we were talking on the plane. Um, and there was a vague plan that I was going to go and do some uh, public engagement afterwards. And literally, while I'd been on the plane flying home, um, three uh, members of the Royal Gurkha Rifles had been killed by one of their Afghan comrades. So unfortunately, the public engagement that I was going to do, which was supposed to be um, 
cautious signs of optimism was why are we being shot by our own comrades. Um, and in 2009, before that, at a very similar event to this, publicising my first book, um, most um, sadly of all personally to me, um, my regiment, the Grenadier Guards, and uh, some Royal Military Policemen, uh, five were shot, again, by an Afghan National Policeman, including uh, a chap called Sergeant Major Daz Chant, who taught me at Sandhurst, was my first um, Sergeant Major, which um, Martin will know is a kind of very important uh, sort of father-son relationships. It's absolutely devastating. Um, and it prompts the question, why? What's going wrong? Why um, are we not engaging if the, the, the narrative is we are in Afghanistan to help the Afghans and the Afghans support our presence and they don't want the Taliban to take control again? Both of which I think are, are broadly correct propositions. Why are we getting to the state where um, comrades are turning their weapons on each other? And there are a number of possible answers to this. Some of them are wildly optimistic. I, I sort of read with a, a wry smile in one of the papers yesterday that um, NATO is selling this as a, a mark of success. We are so successful militarily against the Taliban that the only thing they can do uh, is try and infiltrate and, and shoot us in, in a disguised uniform. Well, that is um, the art of putting a positive spin on something negative, in my opinion. Um, there is a certain amount of truth uh, in the strange and perhaps unpalatable line that is in Afghan culture people turn weapons on each other more readily and sad to say if you look at the statistics of Afghan policemen and Afghan soldiers shooting each other um, the times when they shoot uh, their comrades be they British American Canadian whoever um, do fall into a, a slightly different focus but again I don't think that can necessarily explain it um, and when I set out to write my second book, which was to try and tell the story of the conflict in Afghanistan from an Afghan perspective, which is, I think, a perspective we just don't hear. You hear talking heads from the Ministry of Defence, you hear politicians, you hear non-governmental organisations. They're American, they're British, they're German. Um, when was the last time on the radio or on the television or in the press anyone heard anything from an Afghan about the conflict, which is for their homeland? So I, I went out there and I was very lucky because I'd worked for seven months, hand in hand with the Afghan soldiers, there was an element of trust in the relationship I had with them where I was able to talk to men who I considered friends as well as colleagues and ask them what they thought of what was going on. And what emerged to me over the course of writing that book, and, and I'll just give you two stories as a tales from a, a combat zone, which I think sum us up, is the challenge isn't necessarily military, it's cultural. We are so far apart culturally um, that we're overcoming obstacles that we didn't even imagine were there. So we, we, we go to try and train an Afghan national army, and then you realise that the army is functionally illiterate and functionally innumerate. So you can't train them until you've educated them. Well, how do you educate uh, an intake of what is now 240 growing thousand men who've never had any education at all? And every time we try and take a step forward, we find we're taking two, three, four steps back. Um, and, and two stories which really sum up this, this huge difference, which I couldn't have appreciated with me. Um, the first one was in 2007 when I was there. It was the first big operation I did with the Afghan National Army. We tried to get everything together. We were terribly nervous, not only because we were going into what we knew was going to be a dangerous situation for the first time in most of our careers, but because we didn't feel we had a handle on, on the troops we were working with. We had trained in a very specific way. We'd had very good training, um, and we just assumed we would be working alongside an army that had, had the same, and we were working alongside an army where we didn't even know the names of the soldiers we were necessarily supposed to be uh, in charge of and working alongside. And that hasn't changed. I noticed just before coming here that the BBC and the Daily Telegraph are reporting the perpetrator of the most recent crime uh, against British soldiers in Afghanistan with two completely different names. On the BBC, he's a guy called Zia Udin from Baklan province, which is in the sort of central northeast of Afghanistan. And in the Telegraph, he's called Z um, Zia, uh, Zia Rahman, and he's from Herat. Um, now, this is what I call the kind of lost in translation stuff. And so much of the conflict in Afghanistan, and actually I think so much of the conflict in Iraq, although I, I talk about that less, um, was lost in translation. And if you can't get the translation right, it doesn't matter how good you are, it doesn't matter whether you're winning or losing the military battle, you're never going to make any progress. So this, this first time that this really hit, hit home to me was when I was um, clearing uh, through, through a village, relatively peaceful, and we were supposed to be looking for weapons caches that the, the enemy had been sort of hiding and using to sort of target us. And the one uh, Afghan soldier who I really thought I was getting through to, he had a bit of English, I trusted him, I trusted the interpreter, we, we'd, we'd struck up a bit of a relationship, and I talk about him a lot in, in my first book and in my second book, and he's one of the soldiers I dedicated that book to because he's a very striking personality. Um, 
we were looking for these weapons, and there was a British unit from the Royal Anglians doing it on my left flank, and we were doing it with the Afghans uh, in the middle, and another British unit on the right flank. And the, both the British units were going incredibly slowly because you can't really appreciate how much of a maze of unfamiliarity, weird landscape, um, an Afghan compound village is until you've been in one. You're completely lost. It's like the maze at Hampton Court Palace, except it's made of two-foot-thick stone, and on the top of a couple of the, the hedges are guys with machine guns trying to shoot you. So it's, it's absolutely um, impenetrable. But because I was with the Afghans, obviously it was home for them. They, they knew what they were looking for. They knew what the absence of the normal was and what the presence of the abnormal were. And all the training that British Army had had in Northern Ireland was predicated on us recognising differences because we were at home. And once you're in a territory which is completely unfamiliar, you can't see those differences because everything is different. So my Afghans were doing really well. They were charging through um, uh, and they were making progress. Uh, and we were sort of trying to keep hold on them uh, with a sort of loose rein. Uh, and I'd lost sight of the commander, and I suddenly heard a commotion from behind this wall. So I ducked through the wall, um, and there he was with this young guy, maybe sort of 15, 16, on his knees, with a pistol to his head, and this old woman, who I assumed was this guy's mother, absolutely screaming. And my heart stopped. It's the kind of, uh, you know, sort of Vietnam film crisis moment. This is, you know, I, what do you do? They sort of teach you this at Sandhurst, the nightmare scenario. Uh, there's going to be a war crime. What the hell is going to happen here? Um, and I said, what's going on? And the interpreter was really nervous. He said he's threatening to kill the guy if the woman doesn't show him where the weapons are hidden. I said, what's the woman saying? She was screaming, there are no weapons here. We're just innocent farmers. So I said to the interpreter, you've got to explain to him, this is not how we do it. We can't fight a counterinsurgency like this. You're alienating the population. All the sort of stuff you've heard in the papers. And this argument went on for about two or three minutes, at which point I was suddenly very conscious that I was the only... British guy there, and some of the Afghan soldiers, who were obviously very loyal to their commander, had started looking at me as if, why am I causing a problem? We're supposed to be on the same side. And I was worried I was losing the relationship of trust with them too. Um, and this whole thing was building this horrible crescendo when uh, the woman just sighed, kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, yeah, the weapons are all in the cupboard over there. Um, and there was a huge cache of rifles and RPGs. And this Afghan commander, 47 years old, who'd fought every single conflict going through Afghanistan, just clapped me on the shoulder. And he said, you don't know what you're doing here, and this is how we do it. And I had no answer to that. We were so far apart. The second story, which I'm going to be really quick with, because um, it's slightly briefer, but just shows how different everything is, was the most recent time I was out there. It was Christmas Eve, and I was a civilian this time, and there'd been a real threat that there was going to be loads of attacks by the Taliban because it was Christmas and they wanted to target us during Christmas. And yet the whole area was really quiet. I walked over to the ops tent, and I could see everyone stood outside the ops tent in a big huddle, and I thought, oh, this is trouble, because that normally means something's happened, and you fear the worst. And when I got there, actually, everyone was looking up at the sky, because there was this most amazing formation of the moon refracted through the clouds, creating a kind of giant white ring. And I've never seen anything like it before since. It was absolutely stunning. And so we looked at that, and we went back inside, and everyone thought, well, that's you know, another funny thing you see in Afghanistan. I wandered across to the Afghan side, and it was quiet as a mouse. No one around, no one laughing, no one smoking, no one joking. I walked into their ops room, and everyone was crowded in there. I said, what's going on? And they wouldn't tell me at first. I said, oh, have you seen the thing outside, the clouds? They said, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, what's that called? I said, it's called the Condam Roster. I said, what, what does that mean? And gradually, I got it out of them that there is an old wives' tale in Afghanistan that when this happens, which it does from time to time, if you walk across the ring created by the refracted moon, you change sex. And so none of the Afghan soldiers were going to go out that night for fear of turning into women. And of course, none of the Taliban were going to go out that night for fear of turning into women, because I imagine the worst punishment of all for someone in the Taliban is to suddenly find you're a woman. You've got to sort of oppress yourself. Um, so I went back over to the English side, and I said, oh, you know this thing? It's, uh, apparently, it means you, you change sex. Um, and they said, oh, don't be ridiculous. And that night, there was not a single attack on any of the British outposts, which we ascribed to our brilliant intelligence and brilliant preparation of the battlefield. And I don't think anyone ever checked with the Afghans that it was entirely because both the Afghan National Army and the Taliban were terrified of turning into a woman because of the cloud formation. And when you appreciate that that is how far apart we all are, I think you see the scale uh, of the challenge we face. So I'll, I'll leave you with that, and maybe we'll have some questions later. Thank you.